Welcome to Talking Buffalo, featuring conversations with guests from around the world of sports, media, pop culture, and all things Buffalo, with your host, Patrick Moran. All right, what is going on, everybody? How you doing? Welcome to a midweek episode of Talking Buffalo, episode 905. Good to have you here today. My name is Patrick Moran. Big thank you to everyone out there, as always, for watching and for listening, for following, subscribing. I do appreciate you all very, very much. Uh, We are into the thick right now of the NFL season. The Buffalo Bills, of course, on Sunday, a resounding victory, when you look at the score anyway, over the Tennessee Titans. I started to look forward to the Seattle Seahawks this week. As has been the case for this season, I am joined right now by Matt Warren from SB Nation. What's going on, dude? How you doing? Everything's good. We're good over here. Yeah, that's good to hear, man. Um, this was a uh, a, a weird game, and we'll, we'll we'll talk about it a little bit, and we'll also kind of look forward to, uh, to Seattle. But I actually want to start, Matt, before we even get into like game stuff. A lot of stats, we, you see a lot of numbers that come around a lot, a lot of milestones, things like that. And I kind of want to have a moment here to appreciate Josh Allen a little bit. And I'm not talking about anything he did on the field this game specifically. I'm talking about the fact that he just had his 100th start, which, you know, is a, a Bills fan who's went through a lot of, you know, the drought <laughs> years, a lot of mediocre to worse quarterback play. That in itself, it is a nice accomplishment, but for me, the number that really sticks out, Matt, is 95 consecutive starts. That's not easy to do. I don't care who the quarterback is, but let alone somebody like Josh Allen who plays football the way he does, the way he extends plays, the way he has design runs, the tush push, you know, going balls to the wall to get a first down in a key part of a game where he knows he's got to have it just the way he plays, the hits he takes, the abuse he takes to go out there and suit up now for 95 consecutive games. That's one of the more impressive uh, accomplishments that that I've seen in, in a while for, for any Buffalo Bill. 95 consecutive starts for Josh Allen playing the way he does. Pretty impressive, isn't it? Yeah, and I think on the broadcast they said it was the, you know, the longest start streak for any quarterback in the NFL too. So, I mean – the fact that, and they mentioned it on the broadcast, like the fact that he plays like that kind of all out style and even like, you know, he had to wear the glove on his hand, even this week, um, you know, he's been wearing it for, you know, since the early part of the season, like we knew he was not going to miss time with that. Like, I mean, like you can, you, you can just see how he's protecting himself. Um, he chooses his moments, um, you know, to be a little bit more reckless with his body. Um, you know, but I mean, he's, the fact that he's been able to do that for so long is is really remarkable. The way he, the style he plays in particular, for sure. You know, look, he's. I don't see him having an eighteen year career like Pey- Peyton Manning did. Certainly not playing at the level anything close to what he does because of the way he plays. But for years, we were hearing about him being uh, another Cam Newton type because he is a, a he's a Cam Newton type. But, I mean, he plays at a level, I think, higher than Cam Newton ever did with respect to Cam Newton. But just that style, it does not lend to very long football careers. And, uh, yeah, 95 consecutive games to me. I I just, I I can't get over it. At some point, with the hits he's taken, even a couple times this season alone, it's like, who would fault him if if he had to miss a game, you know? Yeah, I mean, I just looked up Cam Newton while you were talking about him. And, like, he had... He ended up with like 129 starts for the Panthers and like about at 100 starts is when he started to get injured. I'm not like speaking that into existence or anything like that, but he missed like a couple games like here and there, but like he really started to go downhill, but he was also 30 years old. So it's a little bit different Mm -hmm. of, you know, I mean, maybe you could say it's the hits, but also maybe you could just say he didn't develop his game. And so when he hit 30 years old, he started to tank because he couldn't do those you know, physical weird things anymore. And I think obviously Josh Allen is developing his game in a lot different style. I think we're seeing that this year more than perhaps any year in Josh Allen's career. And, you know, he's been at least, I don't want to say a lot, but he's been 
a little more conservative this year with running the football so far anyway, especially of late. Like, he's not taking off yes. running the football as much. But it's not like they're afraid to go away from it. I mean, it didn't work, but they tried to run a design draw for him in the red zone on Sunday and things like yes. that. So it's not like the hand is affecting, uh, you know, his ability to, to, to attempt to run the football. But it just, I don't know, like that stat just kind of blew my mind and just comes such a long way from the days of, uh, you know, like E.J. Manuel and Kyle, and Kyle Orton and all these other guys. Oh, yeah. It's just such a, such a refreshing thing to have. Somebody like Josh Allen is your quarterback. Anyway, all right. So, Amari Cooper. We talked about him a little bit last week. Um, you knew he was – I don't I don't want to say you knew because we didn't know. I mean, he literally just – you know, he got traded in the middle of the week. He had one full practice with the team. Figured he might come out. I, I wasn't surprised he played at all. I thought there might be a couple design plays maybe for him, but maybe it'd be even more of a little bit of a, of a decoy – but do you feel like that Amari Cooper debut like even exceeded what you would call our realistic expectations, especially in the second half? Because he had a drop in the first half, and that was it for him. Everything he did was in the second half of this game when the Bills really started to, to pour it on. But for you, did this, did this debut exceed what your expectations were going in? Yeah, I mean, if he catches that one drop, I mean, he's got five catches for 75 yards in the touchdown. I There's no way I was writing that stat line before the game. I mean, I thought that they would use him like almost exclusively in the red zone, if that makes sense. Like I just didn't sure. see them using him all over the field. Like give him that small package of, of plays and, and get him into the game. But they really did use him all over the field. The thing that surprised me, like despite his like pretty good stat line, dude only played, I think, 35% of the snaps. Like that actually lines up with more of what I was expecting to see than his actual stat line. Like I didn't, I expected him to play around 40% of the snaps and he was under that. So, I mean, they just, I mean, Josh was obviously looking his way, especially in that red zone play where, you know, where he scored the touchdown, but it just, it, so yes, it was surprising his stat line. His usage wasn't necessarily surprising, but I mean, he made good work out of like those 35% of snaps. I like, you know, so when you look at his, his first game and again considering the fact that he literally is new to this team and had just one full practice I still think just in his limited amount of snaps on Sunday I think you saw what he can be for this offense and we'll talk about the other guys in the pecking order and stuff in a second I'm talking about just Amari Cooper specifically right. and the word was you know for people who weren't that familiar Bills fans who weren't that familiar with Amari Cooper coming in you knew about the drops. We've heard about the drops, and he did have a drop, you know, very early in the game. I'm sure nerves might have had a little bit to do with that as well. You know, brand new stadium, I'm sure, very overwhelming to him. Plus, maybe he just drops the ball anyway. He has some drops. It's kind of like with Josh Allen. Josh Allen plays some crazy football sometimes, and you're going to have to live with the occasional, oh, my God, why would Josh Allen do that? That's the price you're going to pay to to get the good. It's kind of like that with Amari Cooper. You're going to have to live with a couple drops here and there to, to get the good Amari Cooper. But anyway, it's the various ways that he beat defenses that to me was most impressive. You know, the touchdown slant, first of all, you got a safety on him. That was a big mistake by Tennessee right there. And, and, he, and he cooked him easily. But some of his other catches too, which by the way, hard catches as well. So, you, yeah. I mean, it's not like the guy doesn't have great hands. You saw it twice in two nice catches. He had a, I think he had a back shoulder catch near the sideline. Mm -hmm. There was another play where they were playing a zone and he found the soft spot in the zone, sits in it, catches it, turns up, and he has a 27 yard uh, running catch. A great play. Another play, they're playing a man to man, quick little slant. Josh throws it actually behind him and he makes it again. A really nice mm -hmm. catch. So you're, you're seeing him. You're, he's beating man, he's beating coverage. And of course, he's going to make the other guys around him better. But you kind of feel like that way, like you saw, like what he can do against a uh, a varying um, types of defenses that Tennessee was trying to throw at them. Yeah, and to see, like, especially like the 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 one that was behind him that you just referenced, like to see him like reach back and and grab that. It just, I mean, it shows me that I'm not really worried about those um, the drops. We talked about this a little bit with Gabe Davis, like he would drop some of the easy ones. Mm -hmm. And he would like come up with contested catches on, you know, balls that maybe, you know, you didn't anticipate he would catch. Um, 
you know, so some players are just like that, you know, if it's that, that easy, like, you know, what I think it was like the, the 10 yard, uh, you know, sideline little, you know, comebacker that he dropped, like, you know, he knew he was open. He knew he had the first down. So maybe he's just already thinking about getting hit or something. Whereas like when you're, you know, trying to adjust to a, a, a poorer thrown ball, like you're just thinking about making the catch. So maybe that's all it was. You know, it's kind of funny too. Again, for new fans who don't really, they, they know the name of Mari Cooper, but they probably never, mm-hmm. they've never heard from him before. They don't know what he's like. You got a little bit of a peek of what kind of personality he had. And it is so reserved and subtle. Yes. Like he catches, all right, it's your first game. It was, and not only was it, it's not like Cooper's catch was a, you know, the, the nail in the coffin to put them up by four scores. That was the go ahead touchdown at the time where he scores on the slant. The crowd goes berserk, understandably so. So did I watching the game. And it would have been easy for him, you know, to, to spike the ball. I was waiting for him to leap. In fact, I expected because he caught the ball near the back of the end zone, drifted towards the stands. I'm like, yo, this dude's going to go in the stands. This is going to yeah, be some great, there's going to be some great imagery, you know, of photographers catching this, throwing the ball to the crowd, whatever. Just kind of hands it back. He's like, yeah, yeah, I scored. <laughs> the he teammates are coming it. up to him. It, it, it's he says the re, and then, listen, this is not an insult, man. This is if anything, right. it's kind of a compliment. Like they were showing Josh at practice, and maybe he'll develop something with them. But Josh has got all of his various wacko handshakes with all these guys. And then with Amari Cooper, they just they just shake hands. <laughs> he wasn't talking a lot. I mean, he he was talking after the game, but he wasn't saying nothing controversial, nothing crazy. What I'm saying is. Stefan Diggs, and it's not one's right, one's wrong. But meanwhile, Stefan Diggs is trying to fight half the Green Bay Packers before the game. <laughs> and he's talking about, I'm not the bigger person. I mean, it's his words, not ours. Um, it's right, a yeah. Stark, it's a stark <laughs> contrast of personality between the old number one receiver and the guy who's absolutely now the new number one receiver. Kind of weird almost in a way, isn't it? Yeah, and... I, I noticed the same thing. I'm like, oh, he's going to go into the, the stands or whatever. He made yeah. it like to the wall. He made it like all the way to the wall. And I think that the fans that were there, like a couple reached out, like patted him on the helmet, but that was it. And they just kind of like turned around. I'm like, that's it. Like, I remember saying it in the moment, like there was a missed opportunity. Um, I think it was Ryan Clark on ESPN. I could be wrong. So don't, you know, don't cold take me. Mm-hmm. But um, when the bills traded for him, um, he said it was, um, kind of like the perfect fit and like the anti Stefan Diggs because of his personality, not necessarily his play on the field. And I mean, you saw that in the post game press conference, even like his first press conference on whatever it was Thursday or Friday with when he met the media the first time, he's just so reserved. He's like, you know, when he says something like the bills mafia is, is different or, you know, people warned me about the bills mafia, not in a negative way, but like, you know, people like he just, he even feels like he doesn't, like necessarily even get like high on the stuff he's actually saying. And so sure. um, just, yeah, he definitely does have that more reserved thing. Uh, like James Cook is a, a little bit of the same way sometimes. And, yeah. and so you, you, you don't see them necessarily celebrate, you know, Josh Allen's running down the field yelling coop with the fans and he's just like standing there like celebrating. So I, th- I think, and again, well, I mean, we're projecting a little bit of certainly a good start, but I, I truly think, and I thought this before the trade, and it's only one game. I get that. But I think this is a good fit for him. His age, yeah. where he's at, the role he has on this team that he might not have on other good football teams, uh, the way I think the fans are going to treat him like gold. And I don't, you know, he might not talk about it, but I'm sure he could feel that. He did say after the game that it's not the first time he's heard coo the chant. But oh, right. It felt yeah. a little bit different to him. Um, this may end up being more than just a rental, which I have felt the entire time. I feel like Brandon Bean, yeah, he was going to trade for him whether it was a rental or not, but I think Brandon Bean, when he made this deal, thought that there's an opportunity here for, for Cole or for Cooper, I will say Coleman, for Amari Cooper to be a guy who's here for more than just a half year. And even if he is only here a half year, he's still a great addition to this team right now for 2024. And I want to be clear about one other thing too. Because I know some people will be like, oh, turn on Stefan Diggs. No, I kind of liked what Stefan Diggs brought to the team as well, too. Yeah. Like if I'm a Houston fan and or if I was a Buffalo fan and Stefan was doing that, what he did against the Packers, and that's happened before with him. I'm mm-hmm. all about that too. I like that. Stefan chooses violence. I'm good with that on the football field. He talks a lot of shit. That's his makeup. That's what makes him 
one of the best receivers in the league. So I'm not saying that I didn't like that. I know there are a lot of people, right. a lot of people, Matt, on social media were just commenting about that. Well, it's nice out to have a diva on this team. This and that bullshit. Stephon Diggs was yes. an elite receiver for four years, and a lot of people loved the, 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 at that time it was the fire, the tenacity he brought. Now he's a yeah. diva that he's gone. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, that was one of the things that I think he really brought to this team was like that competitive edge. Like he had been to mm -hmm. the playoffs. He had like won in the playoffs. Like, I don't know if it's talked about enough, but like uh, the level that he raised in practices, like, or just like in one-on-one -on -one matchups and, you know, just how he helped this team kind of develop that chip on their shoulder that kind of propelled them during the four years that he was here. I mean, how it ended is like different than how it started. And I think even what he's doing with the Texans right now, like bringing that edge to the offense where, you know, Stroud is kind of like that more soft-spoken quarterback. You know, they've got really young players all over that team, really. So bringing in a vet like that that can show them how to practice, how to like get that edge to you when you get into the playoffs, I think is going to be helpful for the Texans just like it was for the Bills. So I'm certainly not going to, you know, drag Stefan Diggs for his right. play on the field or the chip on his shoulder. No. Right. I, I agree with you a hundred percent. You feel like you can envision right now the packing order, like again, just one game. So let's be careful. Let's not get too high on one game, but you can envision the packing order being established right now. And especially as he gets more comfortable and learns his offense in the playbook more, Mario Cooper is going to have the type of role that he had, maybe even a little bit more, but you got Keon Coleman and what he's starting to do routinely, which is, no, make plays down the field. Those back shoulder catches along the sidelines. Two times in three weeks now, he's taken a very short pass, and the defender has tried to tackle him, missed, and it's turned into big plays against Houston. It was a touchdown this uh, this week in uh, against um, who the hell did he just play Tennessee? I'm already got Seattle okay, on my yeah. mind. It was a career high <laughs> 57 yard catch. You know what I'm saying? So you're starting to see that Keon Coleman almost had a a really nice touchdown, but he's becoming that other outside guy that that that, mm -hmm. that number two to me and Khalil Shakir I loved what I saw from him he's a chain mover they actually mm -hmm. ran a screen that worked Spencer Brown pancaked somebody in the oh, head that was or, fun, yeah. or to Batavia he hit that I was it was a hooker <laughs> the safety he hit him so hard but that's what I that's what I like to see from Shakir that's huh? the role I think is perfect for him and then Dalton Kincaid three catches for 52 yards that stat line's not going to blow you away but he was effective. Two of those three catches were very, They're very hard. big catches. So, I mean, yes. you're talking now. It's It feels to me, going forward, if they stay healthy, which is never a given on the Bills, but Cooper, Coleman, Shakir, Kincaid. Those, that's like a tier now by itself. And then you got the others. You might get something from Samuel. You might get something from Knox. You might get something from Matt Collins. But... <laughs> Before, it felt like it was week to week. Like, I'm still not over that Houston game where Matt Collins had six targets against yeah. Houston. I don't want to see that shit again anytime Correct. soon. You feel like a more of a, of a pecking order now is starting to be established with this team, even if it's just one game with Cooper? Yeah, I mean, we're still... As Cooper still gets into the playbook and sort of figures out what he's doing in the entire offense, um, I mm -hmm. think, like, we'll see Matt Collins fall off a little bit. Like, Collins still played... A lot of snaps. I don't have. I don't think I have that number in front of me. But like he played Collins a lot. He played, still, he played a lot. He played like said like seventy three percent of the snaps or something. Yeah. So I mean, he's That's still in there. But like, I hope not. And like we've seen Keon Coleman do better, like at the run blocking stuff too. And that's obviously one of the things that they're having Matt Collins do. They trust him there. So, um, you know, I I still think there's a role for Hollins. But yeah, I do think that that four is going to be your clear top pecking order. Um, you know, we'll see how they mix in Dawson Knox. We'll see how they mix in Mac Hollins, but um, you know, if it's game specific or whatever, but you know, I, I do think that like we talked about this last week, putting Cooper at the top of that list kind of slots everybody in where you want them, right. you know, as, a, as opposed to them playing like all of them playing up a weight class, you know, to, to borrow a term from another sport. I think like when you go to last year's team, this is like, I, I don't like comparisons generally, but like Cooper eventually is going to be like Diggs and Coleman is going to be like a healthy Gabe Davis and Khalil's what he was last year. Hopefully he's that second half of the season. By the way, he's got the best target share in the entire NFL. What that means is if you throw the football to him, it's going to result in a reception. He's literally number one in the NFL. He's only got one target this entire season that did result in a catch. But anyway, I look at Matt Collins as a Trent Shurfield type. I've said this before. 
And I look at Curtis right. Samuel, who unfortunately, is a very, very, very expensive Deontay Hardy type. That's what it seems like uh, Curtis Samuel is. But I like this peck in order. Um, for me, and this was a, a central theme of this episode. If you're watching on the video side, I literally got him on the cover of today's episode. And that's Joe Brady. I think, look, may, maybe this is hyperbole a little bit because I wanted to say Joe Brady might be the most important Buffalo Bill for the rest of the season. That's not actually true. Of course, it's Josh Allen. That goes without saying. But Joe Brady, to me, is going to be critical for this organization for the rest of the season. I need to see that second half. Once that touchdown pass happened to Cooper, I said this with when I had Joe from Queens on our um, immediate post-game show. It's like that might have been the play offensively that turns the way the Bills operate this season around. And from there, they were throwing the football a lot more. They started to get a little more imaginative. Like I said, the way they were using Shakir, the screens. There were multiple times actually where Tennessee was bringing eight, nine guys into the box. I'm talking about in the second half when they're protecting their lead. And instead of just smashing James Cook up the middle against a very good run defense anyway, mm-hmm. they do a couple little quick, you know, hitches right away. To Kilo Shakir gets six, seven yards. They were essentially were serving like runs. But getting Keon Coleman more involved, getting Cooper more involved, Kincaid is not just, it's not the amount of catches he's making. Instead of just little safety valve dump offs, he's having effective, meaningful catches right now. This is the kind of offense I want to see, as opposed to just being so predictable and uninspiring and boring at times. James Cook always going to run the ball on first down. Um, uh, uh, just the unpredictability. That's what right. you know, the Bills' defense, as Stephon Diggs, his role decreased last year in the second half, is because they started to become a little less predictable. They wanted to prove maybe that they can win without him. But anyway, I, I just I, I can't emphasize enough how much I think Joe Brady is going to be important to the success of this team for the remainder of the season. Yeah, and th- like I mean, we saw obviously the the inside handoffs that weren't working well in that first half against the Titans. He was able to mm-hmm. go away from that. What I'm interested in is now that you know he's called the first almost half of the season. Like, how is he going to adjust as defenses adjust? And over the last few weeks, we've seen some of those, like, single reads or first reads that, like, are man beaters that haven't really worked. And so developing, like, you know, the counterpunch to that as teams, like, well, I mean, obviously getting Cooper is going to stop them from, like, just manning up and, like, trying to jam them at the line and, you know, because they have someone that can get separation now. So hopefully that's going to help and, like, allow them to keep, you know, um, evolving as an offense. Mm-hmm. But, you know, what's going to happen now that defenses have the tape on Joe Brady's offense and are starting to adjust, as we saw over the last few weeks, does he have the counterpunch to the counterpunch to the counterpunch to the counterpunch? And um, seeing him develop in that role, same with Bobby Babbage, really, um, you know, as we keep moving forward, is going to be so key. How um How frustrating is it to you to see this team – well, both sides of the football, but for now, we'll just, we'll just stick with the offense. Um, even when they've played well, so they've played seven games this year, okay? They offensively look like crap for most of the first half against Arizona, and they got down 17-3. to um, A disaster in Baltimore. That was a four-quarter disaster for the most part with the offense. They had pretty much one drive that whole game. But again, just very sleepwalky on offense to come out and start games. Houston, same deal. They couldn't get anything going. Now, I will give injuries. You know, Shakir didn't play that game. Um, Again, Matt Collins was your featured receiver. I don't want to see that again. And Josh Allen played terrible. So that's as much on Josh that game as it is Joe Brady. But anyway, point. You, You know what I'm talking about. Just the offense did not look good that game. The offense looked like crap in the first half. This time against Tennessee, they were okay against the Jets in the first half, but at least half their games this season, dude, the the offense has just gotten off to dreadful starts. I mean, that's a lot of it. And I'm sure you're watching these games, getting frustrated with these play calls. It just, I don't know what it is. It just seems a very predictable, unimaginative Joe Brady offense in the first half. And then for the most part, they seem to make adjustments and, and things work out better. That's why I'm hopeful going forward. And maybe with Cooper and what we saw in the second half might change it as well, as well as the running backs, which before I take a break, let me ask you this. 
Um, James Cook has been really good. I, mm-hmm. I mean, really good. But Ray Davis has really come on as well. There are two different types of runners. It seems right now the coaching move has been, um, we'll play Cook for a series. And then when Davis is out there, he's out there for the series. When Cook's out there, he's out there for the series. And we haven't really seen them both used in the same series, certainly not at the same time on the field at the same time. Anyway, if you were coordinating right now, how would you deploy Cook and Davis? What would your timeshare be? How would you use them? Because we are seeing some things now from Ray Davis that have been really impressive these last couple of weeks. Yeah, I still have Cook, you know, a tier ahead of, of Davis. Um, that really long run that Davis had, I mean, was just so impeccably blocked. Like, it's hard to even give Davis credit for it. I mean, I feel bad saying it because, but like there was a hat on a hat. It was just beautifully sealed off. He like, you could drive a Mack truck to the safety, you know, on that, mm-hmm. that one play. But um, so I still have Cook. Like, I think he's a little bit better, like with the vision. Obviously he has more experience, a um, little bit better out of the backfield despite Ray Davis catching a, a Josh Allen bomb 40 yards down the field, whatever it was. Um, you know, so I still have him like clearly ahead of Davis. Um, you know, and then I have like, you, you, I know you didn't mention Ty Johnson, but like I have like Davis is like your two a and Johnson is your two B coming in on third downs type stuff sometimes. So I still think there's that, you know, separation between cook and Davis. I I'm not ready to go like one a cook and, and one B Davis yet. <laughs> All right, I am back here. I'm, uh, I'm laughing. I, I'm talking with Matt Ward from SB Nation right now. We're going over some Bill stuff. I just took a little peek at my my tweets, my tweet deck. And so before the season started, all right, the Buffalo Bills are five and two right now, folks. Obviously, you all know that. Before the season started, uh, Sal Capaccio did an episode of his sales house. It was a live show. We did it at Sports City Pizza Pub uh, on the West Side. Shout out to them, by the way. Great food, great place to hang out. And he had a bunch of media guests there. It was Matt Bove was there, Josh Reed, John Scott. I, I was he, he had me on the show for a few. Um, Alex Brasky, um, Andy Young. Anyway, it never made the air for people because long story short, Sal had a an issue. We'll just say he had an issue with the audio stuff. Um, the mixer and, and it didn't record. It did broadcast out live to the people who were there in person. So the people who were there in person can testify to this. But Matt, as you know, before the season, the Bills had what was going to be a murderous schedule. The three-game road trip, which we know about. Miami on the road in week two. It was going to be a tough-ass game. And this is how we felt before week one. Jacksonville at home, a tough game. I mean, Jacksonville's had the Bills number. So, you know, it's like, all right, three to five, four and four, you know, maybe five and three. It's what you're realistically expecting the Bills to be. A lot of questions with the Bills. And Josh Reed from Channel 4 rather confidently predicted, and it kind of got like, whoa, from he predicted the Bills were going to be 6-2 after eight games. And no one else said that. And now Josh just, that's why I said it, because I, I, I had a tweet about before the season, and Josh just quoted and said one more, meaning that if the Bills beat Seattle this week, <laughs> you won't be right. That would have been, that will be potentially a hot take that Josh Reed nailed. Like I said, he had to be there in the uh, in the building that day to hear him say it. But props to him for calling the Bills. Be, well, not props to him yet. Potentially props to him. <laughs> the guy who called them a uh, 6-2. I want to ask you one question about Sean McDermott. Sure. Kind of in the defense a little bit. Then we'll talk a little bit about the league or at least the conference as well. Mm-hmm. So we talk about the offense just coming out flat and unprepared. But it's also been the defense a lot this mm-hmm. season. Again, they fell into a 17-point hole or 17-3 hole against Arizona at home. They mm-hmm. were down 10 nothing against Tennessee. They, they they got buried relatively quickly against Baltimore. They were down 17-3 at halftime against Houston. This has been a pattern for the Bills this year on both sides of the football. Part of it, of course, on the coordinators. Part of it on the players. just not executing enough. But are you concerned that Sean McDermott is not, for whatever reason, I don't know what it is. I have no clue. Maybe you do. This team just doesn't come out ready to play sometimes. A lot of the times, actually. You know, I'll say Sundays, Mondays, Thursdays, whenever the hell the games are. They just look flat as can be. Um, are you concerned about Sean not having this team ready to play? 
Because my mindset has been with this Titans team, if they were playing the Packers and they look like they did in the first half, they might have found themselves down 24-7 going into that locker room. You know what I'm saying? It's like, how much of a concern of it, if at all, is it to you that Sean just, or for whatever reason, this team just doesn't look ready to, to play in the first quarter? Yeah, I mean, I've been tweeting about it during every game, so I guess I'm concerned. Like, you know, the defense looks like they come out on roller skates giving up, you know, 10-yard chunk plays against the Cardinals in the first game. And then you've, we've seen it in almost every week since then. Um, you know, I don't I don't know if that's a Sean McDermott thing, if it's a Bobby Babbage thing, if it's, um, you know, Ken Dorsey, not Ken Dorsey, sorry, Joe Brady thing. Um, but I don't, it's hard to pinpoint where the blame lies with that. And like, to their credit, they've been able to turn it around in every game. But like, when you find a team that takes advantage of it, you get buried like you did against the Baltimore Ravens. And then your whole offense has to go out the window because now you're playing catch up the whole time. And so it just, it feels like it's going to bite them when they start to play, you know, whether it's the Chiefs, even though the Chiefs aren't playing great, the 49ers, even though the 49ers aren't playing great. And then like the Lions for sure later in the season before we even get to the playoffs. And, you know, I think we lose like focus on that. Like, we're almost always talking about what's going to matter in the playoffs. And so like, I'm glad they were able to turn it around against the Titans, but that ain't going to matter when, you know, the games are really, really, really important, um, you know, in January. And that's where at least my focus is usually like when Sean McDermott makes a coaching mistake in the regular season and I give him grief and everyone's like, Oh, they're going to win this game anyway. I'm like, that's not the point. The point is we want to be better when it, it counts. And, and so, yeah, I'm worried about that. I'm worried about that a lot. <laughs> To you, to use a, let's use a boxing analogy here. Actually, I grew up okay. a big fan of boxing, and there were there's fighters sometimes that are they're almost willing to to throw away the early rounds. They they're feeling their opponent out. They're willing to get you know they're yeah. willing to lose on points. Maybe they're not. I should say the early rounds, but at least the first, maybe the second round. They want to see what their opponent has. Then they make adjustments and these great fighters, you know, typically will then at that point overcome their opponent and knock their ass out, whatever. I kind of feel like to some extent, that's what it is with the bills. Like a boxer will come out conservative again. You know, they just, they're feeling they, they, their opponent out. The bills seem like they're doing that both sides of the football. You know, I've complained, you've complained about the, uh, the boring, predictable, unimaginative nature of the bills offense early in games defensively, you don't think of it that way, but it's kind of the same. Like they're playing that base nickel. They're not moving off from it. They're not running blitzes early in the games. They're not doing stunts. They're not really doing anything. And this defense is willing to give up points or certainly yards and drives early. And then mm -hmm. they kind of hopefully depend on who they play anyway. Well, actually with the exception of the Baltimore game, the defense has clamped down even against Houston. They clamped down uh, pretty well mm -hmm. after that, but that's frustrating to me as well. You know, in Tennessee, to their credit, in the first half, at one point, Bobby Babbage finally got off that nickel defense for one play, and he brought Baylor Spector out. So they had a three linebacker set. I watched the All-22. Quite literally, that, that first play, Mason Rudolph throws a 19-yard pass right at Spector, identifies him, bam, easy 19-yard game. Spector's off the field uh, the very next play. But in the second half, now, granted, you have a lead, the crowd's going, it's easy to get, you know, hyped up, turned mm -hmm. up, but they started blitzing more in the second half. They started running some stunts and things like that that were working. They weren't just rushing their front four and drop, you know, doing kinds of zone blitzes, stuff like that. They just started mixing it up more. But defensively, I'm equally frustrated at how Bobby Babich is just really conservative early on in these games as well. Yeah, I mean, to your point, the zone blitzes, I think were a big change. Um in that game, like to confuse Mason Rudolph because mm -hmm. like Greg Rousseau, and I'm sure we're going to talk about him later. Greg Rousseau was playing his ass off in the first, um, first quarter. Like I tweeted that out, like he was getting after it. Um, I thought that the bills front four did a fine job, but when they got close to Rudolph, he had dump off options or he had like a screen option or whatever. And so he was able to get rid of the ball. And it wasn't necessarily that the front four was doing a poor job. It was just that like the Titans had kind of planned for that and then had built in, like those those counters to that and for whatever reason the bills back seven wasn't really doing a great job tackling and we've seen that over the years like how you know those dump offs can turn into you know eight nine ten yards on a play 
and it was kind of really crystallized in the first half. So when they changed it up in the second half to confuse Rudolph a little bit, it worked really well. Uh, well, well let's, let's talk about Greg Rizzo right now. All right, let's do he's, it. <laughs> he's headed towards, I'll tell you what, that might have been one of the better just 0.5 sack games I've, I've seen from a defensive edge. So he had, what, yeah. six quarterback hits, which is like the most of any mm-hmm. – any lineman or any defensive player, I should say, a quarterback gets in one game in two years, actually. Two years, yes. This yes. is two weeks now where he's been arguably the best player on the football field twice this season now, two times seven games. That's yes. almost a third of your, of your games. Mm-hmm. There's been some others where he's just been all right. Now, even where he doesn't show up much on the stat sheet, I still think he's better than what mm-hmm. any box score would indicate. Um He's headed towards being a really interesting, and I hate to talk about the offseason when we're seven games into a potentially, yeah. you know, playoff run type season for the Bills, but can't help myself here. This might be an interesting decision in the offseason. Now they've already um, given him a fifth year option, so they don't have mm-hmm. to do anything this summer, but you don't want that guy going into a fifth year if you can help it. Is this a guy that you feel confident enough in? to make a, a major investment in because signing him, and I don't even know details, but I do know this, it would not be cheap. Has he done enough for you consistently that, you know, with the timing of when he's going to be a free agent, maybe he's a top 10 to 15 paid edge guy in the entire league. Um, what's your comfort level with giving a guy like this money? It's a lot more for me today than it was on Saturday. I'll, I'll say that, but, uh, What's your, what's your thought on that? Yeah, I I was one of the people that thought they would extend him this past offseason, to be perfectly mm-hmm. honest with you. I, I would have been totally fine with that. I think he's shown enough. Um, he's only going to be 25 years old this coming offseason. So, like, he's got plenty of runway left still. Um, I think a lot of his plays aren't necessarily reflected in the box score, whether it's, you know, the edge contained. Like, he just always seems to be in the right position, and his length can impact the offense. Um, you know, they've been running to the other side a lot too. Um, they haven't been running at Greg Rousseau. Um, and so I think he just does impact, you know, what offenses can do. He's probably going to end up making more than $20 million per season. Um, like almost like up to their like Max Crosby money, even though he doesn't quite have, you know, that Max Crosby impact. But I think that's like kind of what you're looking at. And so I, I would not be surprised if they did that this off season. His cap hit for next year is going to be $13.4 million with that fifth year option. They could lower that considerably by um, you know, giving him whatever it is, $20, $30 million up front and you know, prorating that over the course of the whole deal and um, you know, really reload at some of the other positions um, as they you know, continue to manage their cap. So I think there's a lot of reasons why Greg Rousseau is going to be the next Brandon Bean draft pick that gets extended. Uh, you know, it's not just about production and talent, you know this, you see it around the league every year. It's about timing too. Don't get me yep. wrong. Greg Brazil's got plenty of production and plenty of talent, but when you slot in, well, how's this guy the sixth best, you know, highest paid player at his position? Well, because he hit free agency at the right time on the right team that had the right amount of cap space to make that, um, to make that work. That's as far as I'm willing to dive into something when the off season going on, I said, Greg Brazil might've been the best player on the field. One mm-hmm. more guy wanted to hit on because if he wasn't, Terrell Bernard mm-hmm. was. This guy's just unbelievably good, such an impactful player. And with all due respect to Balen Specter, it's just nine and day difference when oh, yeah. Terrell Bernard's out there as opposed to Specter. You know, the play of the game, and we didn't really talk about it today, don't really need too much, but I, I think it was that fourth and two run stop. Um, that really oh, yeah. turned the tide of the game. Well, on third and one, the play before that, it was Bernard and, and Dorian Williams that stuffed Pollard when they tried to run a wildcat play to set up fourth and two to really turn that game around. He recovers a fumble because he's just got a nose for the football. He's shooting gaps. He's beating pulling guards and tackles mm-hmm. to spots, making plays. I love this dude so much, man. But, but <laughs> it's worrisome, the injuries. Yeah. Um. He's what, 220, 225, like soaking wet. Why he's such a physical, reckless abandon type of style of football? Because that's what he's got to do to be effective. You know what I mean? If he just stands around, yeah. he's going to get blocked out of the stadium. Um, as, as we record this Tuesday around lunchtime, we don't know the extent of an ankle. I am 
What's your level of concern based on what Sean McDermott said on Monday? I don't want to get too much into the weeds here because mm -hmm. by the time this drops, maybe there will be some information. But right. Sean would not commit to him being day-to-day, -day, said there was going to be further evaluation. They would know more tomorrow. My guess is unless somebody would source information like Schefter or, or Rap Sheet, tweet something, we probably won't learn more until Wednesday practice. But, I mean, it's... It's a positive that he walked out of the stadium, no walking boot after the game, stuff like that. But this is an ankle. He's, you know, his game is predicated on speed. He might miss some time. Um, yeah. How concerned are you about his, I don't want to say, I don't want to call him injury prone, but it's kind of virgin on that territory. Such a great player. They need him. But another injury, man. This is, this is yeah. worrisome to me. Yeah, he kind of came out of nowhere for me when they drafted him. I was one of the guys. It's like, what are you guys? What are you doing here? Like, what? What are we? Uh, why? And like, now you obviously see it. But like, we talked about this with Matt Milano's injury history. Like, the the broken leg in London was a freak injury. You know, like he didn't have like those wear down injuries until like this bicep injury that he's got going on right now. Mm -hmm. Bernard, on the other hand, has like a lot of those like maintenance injuries, right? Like the the torn pec, the um, you know, the, the ankle, all of these things. So like, that is a little bit worrisome to me. Um, you know, we've seen it with a guy like you know, Taron Johnson, who all very similar position on the field, always sure. throwing himself, you know, into the mix, you know, he was able to turn it around with the help of the bills training staff. So like, hopefully at some point we get whatever that Taron Johnson plan is with Terrell Bernard and we can like sort of figure that out. But yeah, it, it, it I think it needs to be concerning because like the, I mean, as as well as Dorian Williams has like kind of stepped in, and you know, and even Balen Specter, like as well as they've played, well as they played as they've come in, they're certainly not the impact players that you know Matt Milano and Terrell Bernard are. And you need those guys in the middle of your defense when you do have you know a little bit suspect you know safety play and and all that other stuff that's been happening with the Bills defense. So if he can't go, you know, this Sunday, they might get a little bit lucky with TK Metcalf being out, but. You know, if he can't go this Sunday, it's going to be a little bit worrisome for what, what's going to be happening against that Seattle Seahawks offense. Hey, pretty high-powered offense. Uh, real quick here, I Dorian Williams. I think Dorian Williams has played well. He's getting progressively better. I think he's mm -hmm. developing into a nice starter. That said, I'm seeing more and more people on social media say that they think Dorian Williams should continue to start, even if Matt Malata comes back because he's been out all season. He's been hurt most of the last couple of years. And... uh you know, he might be rusty, this and that. It's not that that's not sensible, but this is freaking Matt Milano. I mean, <laughs> I kind of just slanted the question that I was going to ask you, but is you think there's any chance that's happening? I don't. If Matt Milano's active because he's healthy enough to be active, Matt Milano is going to be out there and not Dorian Williams. Although I'm props to Dorian, man, but come on. What yeah, do we, what I, do we do? What I'm we doing? buying into that. No, I'm not buying that, no. <laughs> Especially because oh. how much money how much money the, the the bills have committed to Matt Milano next year. They really can't get out of the contract, you know, this off season. Um, so like, you know, he's going to be here next year. So there's really no point in seeing what you have in Dorian Williams because you know, Milano is going to be here next year. So I don't know. I don't I, see it. My thought is and look, you're again, you're in the season right now and you want Dorian Williams focused every week on the game plan and, you know, doing the best job he possibly can. But if I'm Sean McDermott, if I'm Bobby Babich, I want Dorian Williams getting more work at middle linebacker during the, maybe during the week, some reps there, because my mindset is this. If you could get a healthy Terrell Bernard and a healthy Matt Milano out there, those are your linebackers. I like Dorian Williams to be that third linebacker. If you're playing a 4-3, he's that third linebacker. Obviously, if Milano goes down, Dorian steps right back in. But if Bernard goes down, I'd like to see Williams get enough work where I can feel comfortable where he could be the mic as opposed to to bail inspector. I don't know if that's possible though, being, you know, eight yeah, weeks now I, I, into a season, but he's your he's your best backup linebacker if your unit is healthy. I want to see him out there regardless of what guy would go down. Yeah, I mean, think about playing the Ravens again in the playoffs. Wouldn't you love to have three linebackers that you could put out on the field? No offense to Terry Johnson, who obviously you know, has done well against sure. the Ravens in the playoffs. Like, but, uh, but like if, you know, they didn't have Derrick Henry then. So if Derrick Henry is running the ball down your throat, wouldn't you want those three guys on the field at the same time? I mean, I just, you, I, I, it think would you be have nice. I think you have to, I think, you know, if you play the Ravens again in the playoffs with that offense, 
you got to let Lamar, you got to make Lamar beat you through the air. So I agree. I think you got to play a lot more 4 3. Teron Johnson is an all pro slot corner, literally, but go yeah, ahead. he his snap count's going to go down if you play the Ravens again. Nothing against him. It's because you got to have more beef up uh, in that front seven. And by the way, when I asked you that question about Dorian getting work in the mic and possibly playing the mic, I just envision people like, uh, like Joe Marino and Eric Turner, some wow. of these guys just probably snapping on me mentally. Like, what, what is this? What is this guy an idiot right now? Suggesting that you want to get him ready to play middle linebacker. I get all that. Um, quick look into Seattle. All right, so they're playing Seattle this week. Seattle is a uh, they're kind of an enigma team right now. I feel like they're what, what are they now? They're uh, four and three. So they lost three in a row, but then they smacked Atlanta this past mm-hmm. weekend. Uh, Geno Smith has been thrown for a ton of yards. He's thrown for at least 284 yards five times this season. He's just under 2,000 yards passing for the year. He's only on eight touchdowns, and he's been picked six times. He's been sacked 20 times. So he's effective through the year, but he's also mistake prone. You mentioned DK Metcalf. He has been torching teams this year. He's already got four games where he's had 99 yards receiving or more. He's got a knee injury. I'm not counting that dude out. Um, Seattle's not as we record this either, but it's not likely that he's going to play. That would be a big right. blow. They can run the football too. They're averaging four and a half yards per carry. So they got a lot of talent on offense. Uh, defensively, by the way, shout out Tyrell Dodson. By the way, he leads the team in snaps. He's playing every down for Seattle this year. I looked up the, the snap counts for these some of these guys before we went on the air. Huh? It's like, holy shit. So he's an every day or an every down player for them. Um, Julian loves a really good safety. Uh, Derek Hall's got five sacks. Devon Witherspoon, one of the best young corners in the NFL. So him versus Cooper or him versus Keon is going to be fun. Uh, quickly here before we talk about the AFC. Like, what are your early thoughts right now, Bills versus Seattle? What are your thoughts on Seattle? Yeah, I mean, obviously, if DK Metcalf isn't playing, they're a different team. Or even if he's limited. Let's say he doesn't practice all week. He's limited practice on Friday. And then he's able to give it a go on Sunday. I still think that helps the Bills that he's not 100%. Because um, like you said, he's torching guys. And like if his knee is a little bit wonky, maybe he's not torching them. Maybe he's just better than them. You know, you know the difference between <laughs> yeah. that like level. Like So, I mean, I, I think without DK Metcalf, they're obviously a different team. Um, hopefully, like we get some nice play out of DeMar Hamlin. Like this might be the one game where it's like, you know, DeMar Hamlin's playing 20 yards off the ball. Maybe it's the right play in this game if DK Metcalf is playing, you know. So, um, but, you know, their defense is suspect. They allowed 21 or 42 points to the Lions, 29 to the New York Giants of all teams, and 36 right. to the 49ers. But they were able to hold the Falcons in check. So, like, they're a little bit Jekyll and Hyde. They are a little bit streaky. Um, we'll see how it goes. They, like you said, four and a half yards per rush. Um, you know, is, is 14th in the NFL, but they're only 27th in rushing yards. So th- maybe they get away from the rush too early. I don't know. Um, I don't know too much about them, um, but, you know, they, they don't have a great third down conversion percentage, which should change against the Bills because the Bills always allow third down conversions. Yeah. Um, so like, half, if the Bills can get them off, yeah, if the Bills can get them off the field on third down, like other teams have been, like, I mean, that's that's the key to success against the Seahawks. It's always tough, too, to go play in Seattle. I mean, that is a very loud environment. Their fans are uh, are great. Let's talk about them. I'm going to have a Friday preview episode. I'm not ready to predict, you know, and have both right. predictions and stuff like that. I will say this. I do think this is a good matchup for the Bills. Like, this is a week where I could see the offense looking good for more than just two quarters. Like, maybe even three and a half quarters. And Geno Smith will rack up some yards. and. Yeah, I could also see him making some mistakes too. So and paying for them. Um, Von Miller's got this will be his last game, right? This is his fourth game coming up yes. of uh, of the suspension. So I like I like the way the Bills' pass rush has been. I'm not going to give him too much credit for the Titans game because that offensive line was a disaster. That was a, a borderline joke. That Titans offensive line, but it was good to uh, to see them. Anyway, we're on the AFC real quick here. Uh, the Jets, dude. <laughs> Jets feel like 100 percent toast. I got to tell you, uh, it's been quite a while since I've seen a non-Bills game that I enjoyed more than watching the Jets lose on Sunday night to the Pittsburgh Steelers. I think the Jets are at a point where if you're not a Jets fan, I think the rest of the league at this point hates the Jets. Um, It was fun to see. 
They're that they're two and five. They feel like a hundred percent toast. It's crazy because you know, all the talk was about Aaron Rodgers instead of Zach Wilson. They were no better last year or this year than they were last year with Zach Wilson. They're not scoring points any better this year than they did last year with Zach Wilson, but they already got five losses. Dude, this is the NFL. This is not major league baseball. You don't have a hundred more right. games. You're you already played seven and you're two and five. And I looked, I took a peek at their schedule before we came on. They still got to play Houston. They still got to play at Buffalo. They still play Seattle. They're playing at Jacksonville and Jacksonville might be showing some signs of life now. And that's a road game. They play Miami twice, divisional rival at Arizona. Not so much, uh, you know, I wouldn't call that down team, but Arizona looks really, really good three to four times a year. Point being is this. <laughs> at most, at most, if you want to be a wild card team, I think at most you can lose two more games. Yeah. You got to be your seven, 10 and seven, probably get you in, into the playoffs. Their margin for error is almost gone at this point. And I don't see no end. Yeah, like, right. The coaching sucks. Aaron Rodgers is there. Even his numbers might look okay, but he, he can't block. He ain't playing. The Jets defense is like shockingly bad recently. Um, are they toast to you? I mean, yeah, their offense sure looks like it. I mean, I just, I mean, they gave up 37 points to Russell Wilson. Like, I know that they didn't have, I don't think they didn't have tape on him in the, in the Steelers you know, offense. And like he started slow and maybe the Jets defense was like, Hey, we're going to do fine in this. And then he just absolutely torched them. So, um, you know, I, there's no, there's not one thing you can point to on that Jets team or coaching staff. They're like, yeah, I'm convinced that they're going to be the reason that this team turns around. Like, I don't think Devonte Adams like is going to come in and turn around that offense. I mean, as good as he is, like, I just don't see that. Like, are they going to get a piece in return for Mike Williams that's going to help them? Probably not. It's probably going to be a draft pick. And, like, how many more losses do they have to go through before the wheels just completely fall off? I mean, Rodgers is also running out of people to blame. He blamed the media after this game, by the way. Yeah, like that was, it was fun. You know, Robert Sala, Mike Williams. Like, oh, no, we're, we're to the media blaming portion of our season. So, I mean, it. You know, if they lose to the Patriots, man, I just don't know if there's like a way back for them. So it'll be that interesting be to see what happens this weekend. It would be funny. It would, I would love it. But that know. would be a highlight. Losing at New England would be a highlight. I don't expect it, but that would be. I'm rooting highlight. for the Patriots. Who knows? Yeah, like, what's yeah. happening here? <laughs> Tom Reddick is back with them now. This he's practicing this mm -hmm. week. But he's going to have to ramp up. And right. once he gets a long term deal, I'm not sure you're going to get the best of Son Reddick. Let's just. Let's just put it that way. I mean, the guy came into camp because they worked out a deal where he wouldn't get all the, these fines for missing. Anyway, my opinion, Jets are done. Uh, two is back, yep. or he will be back soon. Anyways, practicing. We don't. They don't know if he's going to play the goals for him to play this week against Arizona. If not, they play the Bills the following week in Orchard Park. Uh, your thoughts on two? Uh, ah, your thoughts on Miami too? I, I, yeah. Yeah. Um his press conference was really weird. Um, when he came back on Monday, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, he said some super dark things. I thought, um, you know, I, if he wants to wear the guardian cap or not, that doesn't like bother me really. He's already wearing a helmet that is like s supposed to like be designed mm -hmm. to prevent concussions. And, you know, if he, I think that the, the data is very much out on the guardian caps for players like quarterbacks. I think it's much better data for, offensive and defensive linemen because of the repeat, the repeated headbutting as opposed to what, you know, Tua goes through when he, you know, hits Demar Hamlin uh, with his head. Um, but, you know, just some stuff like, you know, if football could be the death of me or whatever he said like that, I don't know what he's thinking. I don't know what's going through his head. He's trying to like portray this like um, tough guy image. Warrior. Yeah. He's like, and I, 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 so I guess I understand that, but like just some of the stuff he said was really off-putting for me. Um, and like, I, he's had one, he's averaging a concussion every 17 games. So it's like, this is, it's just hard to watch what he says and line it up with reality. He's like, I'm going to play the odds. Well, the odds are that you're going to get concussed once a season. Like we've already determined this stat. Like, so I just, I don't know. He's a good player. I hope he doesn't get hurt again the rest of his career. But like even some of the stuff he was saying was just felt dark. It was, yeah, he's a nice guy. He's an intellectual and yeah, he was talking like a warrior. It was kind of borderline, uh, 
weird. I think because he's a a name, a high pro- profile quarterback, this could be the guy where, and I hope it doesn't happen. So we're clear, but Tua could be one concussion away from the league saying no, not him, not leaving it up to the player or even the team. I think he gets one more concussion. This could be the league saying, ah, I don't think so, man. You know what I mean? I, 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 could, I could see that happening. Uh, as for this team, they're toast. They're toast. They're done. They're, they're, they're not good. Their offensive line sucks. Their secondary after Ramsey, who I still think is overrated, but even if you want to give that to him, Holland's hurt. Hoyer, I love Jordan, but your boy's washed. They're, they're missing too much. They got a murderous schedule in there to the back end of the season. This was supposed to be where they racked up their wins. Not exactly. two and four. They're coming to Orchard Park in two weeks. I just, yeah. <laughs> the biggest thing about right now where we're at that I just, I'm stunned. It's not that the Bills are five and two. It's not that the Bills are in first place. It's that the Jets aren't four and three or five and two. It's that Miami's three not five clear. and two or four and three. Yeah, they're so far in front. To me, that's just um, stunning. A couple more quick things. Yeah. I go to bed Monday night. And I sent out a late night tweet. The Ravens smacked Tampa. Lamar was unbelievable. And I put up this gif of making, I'm not making fun of Bills fans, but Bills fans, it was somebody throwing a temper tantrum. They're going to wake up Tuesday morning if you went to bed early and find out that Josh Allen is no longer the front runner for, uh, for MVP. It's got to be Lamar right now. Two, two for 333 yards, five touchdowns on Monday night. He's got more passing yards, more touchdowns, higher completion percentage, more rushing yards. And they beat the Bills. They beat the shit out of the Bills. Lamar's the front runner. Now, look, it's October. It's week seven. It's like the stock market. Shit goes up. Shit goes down real quick. But the funny part is, and I understand it, because all fan bases, I'm sure, would be the same way. People who cared on Sunday about Josh Allen being the betting favorite, the front runner, suddenly don't care. MVP means nothing. Give me a Super Bowl. That's all I care about. Well, yeah, of course, that's more important winning a Super Bowl, but don't say that MVP doesn't mean anything to you anymore right. when it meant plenty to you on Sunday. Lamar is such God. He's already won two. Now, granted, last year he was, it was a weak MVP. Oh, 100%. But if he, win, if he wins, a speculator, if he happens to win a third MVP, it's almost borderline embarrassing how under the radar a three-time MVP would be because – we still talk about the greatest quarterbacks, and it's always Mahomes, and then either Josh Allen or Mahomes or uh, Burrow, whatever order you want to put it in. Sometimes you'll even say Dak Prescott or Jordan Love or C.J. Stroud. It's like Lamar's like the fourth, fifth, sixth guy talked about sometimes. This guy's got two MVPs, and as, of, as we record this, he's on his way to a third. Wild to yeah. me. Yeah, I think Josh is probably third at best in the MVP because Jared Goff is also playing pretty darn well this year on leading that Lions offense. Mm -hmm. And so to the top of the NFC, and that's the thing, like the Bills right now, like you look at their path to the playoffs, they're probably going to be the fourth seed. And if, or even the third seed. And so when you look around the NFL, that's kind of what doomed Josh last year, I think, is that Lamar's team did so much better than Bill's team that you know, folks didn't necessarily give the Bills the benefit of the doubt there, or Josh Allen, you know, by extension. So I, it's obviously part of the MVP conversation where your team finishes, even though, you know, wins aren't a QB stat. But you see that they vote for the team, the, for players on the teams that are first or second every year. And so the Bills really have to rattle off a bunch of wins if we want Josh Allen MVP to happen. Sure. Look, I want to be real clear about this too. As things stand right now, at least anyway. Um, the Ravens look really good in the regular season. And then they've done this before though. And then the playoffs come and they're a different (laughs) team, but I want to be real clear late here in October. I would much, if things play out the way the standings look like they're going to, I would much rather be the fourth seed than the third seed because I would play the chiefs 10 out of 10 times right now before playing Baltimore, which when it comes to the Chiefs, God, is it weird this year? Pat Mahomes is having an awful season statistically. He is. Been solid. They make enough plays. They get a couple breaks. Whatever it takes, they win. Very impressive win this week though, all against Frisco on the road. Mm-hmm. But the Chiefs might be 10-0 and when they come to Orchard Park on November 17th because their next three games before Buffalo, they're at Vegas. They're at home against Tampa. 
and they're at home against Denver. That is a, this is setting up to be the 10 and 0 Kansas City Chiefs coming to Orchard Park. I don't know what the Bills record would be. Um, potentially eight and two, maybe seven and three, but man, what a game that's going to be. But yeah, the Chiefs with Pam Mahomes just playing awful at times. They're, yeah. they're, they're still undefeated. It's just wild to me, dude. Yeah. And the Bucks aren't going to have Chris Godwin and the they might not have Mike Evans, so like that game is a little bit like you might see the Bucks on the schedule be like, hey, maybe Tampa can knock off the Chiefs, but I, their offense is going to look way different than it has the first half of the season. And then, you know, the four and three Denver Broncos, the wild card position Denver Broncos. Are you put? Are you are you talking down about Bo Nix's? No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, I, they're they're going to come back to earth at some point. Yeah, you're definitely right. The Chiefs can come to Buffalo 10-0. That would be a fun game. I'm sure CBS or whoever's broadcasting the game is salivating. Is that a night game? Uh, it's a night a game? Four, four, 425. Bills, Chiefs? Okay. Yeah. 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 It'll be a, it's a 430 okay. game. I'm sure yeah, CBS yeah. is very much yeah. salivating over that CBS one. is holding that game. That game, a lot of people have been saying, oh, that's got to be the primetime game. No, it's not because No, it's CBS definitely not going to be. They get a certain right. amount of holds. They were holding on to that game. That's just not going to get flexed. CBS is not going to let that happen. One last scene, the rod here. I want to drop on you real quick here. Don't sleep on them, man. The Bengals, they're three and four now, and they feel like they're ready to, to heat up. Now, granted, their three wins are against Carolina, the Giants, and Cleveland. I get that. And they started out 0-3. They were dead. Um, but, again, they've won three of their last four. Jamar Chase has already got 620 yards receiving, six touchdowns. The offense is really heating up. The defense has been kind of shitty. Um, they lost in overtime to Baltimore. That was a great game, by the way, 41-38. Yeah. But that defense is going to get at least respectably good. And maybe they're going to be like the early 80s Chargers with Dan Fouts who just try to throw the ball every down and outscore everybody. But don't sleep on the Bengals yet, folks. They're they're far, far from done. And they got a winning pedigree with a, with a quarterback who's a winner if he can stay healthy. So I'm not out on the Bengals they're, they're yeah, I'm not out on them either, but they're another team that they're playing from behind. They don't have a lot of room for error because, you know, it, they're playing the Eagles this week. They've got to go to Baltimore to play the Ravens. They have to go mm -hmm. to Los Angeles and play the Chargers. They still have both their games against the Steelers. They're at the Cowboys. They do have to play the Broncos, who might be okay. I don't really know. But, like, you know, so, like, they still have a lot of potential – stumbles coming up and that's why sure. you see like the statistics of Owen Owen three teams that don't make the playoffs. It's not that like they're a, ba a bad team. They could still win nine games, but like if they're going to win nine games, they have to go whatever, six and three over the course of their last seven. And you know, that's, that's a tall yeah. t task. I, my, my numbers are wrong there. I don't, but they still have to, they have to win a lot more games than they lose, and there's just a lot of potential prep balls there. Well, this is why Matt, Matt does his homework better than I do because you just read out that schedule like, oh, 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 oh. It's right here. You know what? I, I know. know. It's, uh, it's just there. <laughs> so I was lying to the good people watching and listening to this show no. because the Bengals are done. You can sleep on them. <laughs> no, don't. I'm not what? saying that. I'm not saying that. But just like, you know, it, it's hard to – make the playoffs after you start 0 and 3. And so like, I mean, yeah, they I mean, losing to the Patriots notwithstanding, that sucked. But like, you know, they lost to the Chiefs, they lost to the Commanders who looked great, and then they lost in overtime to the Ravens, a team that absolutely smoked the Bills. So like, their losses have been quote unquote good losses except for that Patriots game that, you know, week 1 we can sometimes throw away, but like it just it they're playing catch up yeah. and so they just don't have that room for error that say Buffalo does. Buffalo like they're going to have a stinker here or there and they're still going to be, you know, two games clear in the AFC East. So it's like they have right. that room for error. And that's important to say. And we'll add on that note, too. The, the best thing yeah. about the way this week played out for the Bills is not only beating the Titans, because I think everyone expected that, but also Miami losing to the Colts and the Jets losing at Pittsburgh really created what you just said, a little bit of a cushion, mm -hmm. some margin for error for the Bills. You don't want them to go out and have a staker. I certainly think they're very capable of beating Seattle. In fact, at this time, maybe I'll change my mind, but I, I would expect that. But even if they stumble, they, they've created a, enough of a cushion. You don't want to use up that cushion now, but they've created a cushion that they're still going to be in good shape. And to me, again, uh, that's just borderline shocking. Anyway, uh, all right, it's going to do it for this episode. Make sure you follow Matt on Twitter at Matt Rich Warren. 
Again, SB Nation, especially if you're a football fan, you don't have to be a Bills fan, whatever team uh, you follow, or this week the Bills are playing Seattle, you want to catch it. What's the, what's the name of the Seattle blog on SB Nation? There's so it's many of them. Field, so many. Yeah, what it's is Field it? Goals. Field Goals, like Field Goals, but G-U-L-L-S for Seagulls. Oh, so Field Goals, Mookie, Mookie Alexander, Mookie does a great job over there. We love him. I know he's going to be on at least one of the Buffalo Rumblings podcasts this weekend. So definitely check That's that cool. out. Well, go check that out. Like I said, if you want to catch up, I like to follow the other team as well mm-hmm. on a week they're playing. So I'll be checking it out as well. But anyway, for Matt, I'm Patrick. Be back. Brand new episode tomorrow.